Welcome to In Business. I'm your host, David Wojcik. On each show, we present many stories from the Peel region. We visit events and feature entrepreneurs and their companies. We start each show with our In Business report. If you know of a great new idea, newsworthy business event, or have an idea for the show, go to our website, www.rogerstv.com slash inbusiness, and click on my email link. Send me the details so we can cover it. I love hearing from our viewers. Today we hear from the Minister of Labor, Peter Fonseca, about his plan to protect us from violence in the workplace. Heidi Brown is here with her Small Business Tip of the Week. We speak with an entrepreneur who plays an international shell game of business. And our panel discusses the future of Canadian technology. First up, the Human Resources Professional Association of Peel held their annual general meeting and invited Peter Fonseca, the Minister of Labor, about a most controversial piece of legislation affecting the workplace. It's Bill 168, protecting workers from violence in the workplace. But the bill is far-reaching and some say crosses over several ministry boundaries. Our in-business crew was on hand and filed this report. We want to ensure that our employees are, are safe when they go to work and no, nobody should have to go to work and fear uh, for their life or that they are being harassed uh, at work. The Human Resources Professional Association Peel Chapter recently held a dinner to address key issues and concerns that face their profession and to look at new initiatives. Well, we're really a growing profession, and we're a profession that has much more in the way of development and standards than we ever did before. Um, many years ago, you looked at human resources as personnel, and today um, we have a very broad set of responsibilities and, and a leadership capacity. So that's really, and that's just going to continue on uh, for years to come. Well, HR professionals play a very important role in businesses, much beyond just hiring and firing and disciplinary. Uh, actions, but they help develop the skills and aptitude of our workforce. And all our businesses, you know, really do have to pay close attention to not only the needs of the business, but the resources that are required to help support that business and also to sustain it in the future. And human resources professionals, and especially through organizations like HRPAP, play a very important role in developing those human resources professionals who in turn support the development of their staff and employees. One of the association's main concerns is what advice its members should be giving to their employers. We're a profession that is very reliant upon a ministry. Um, a lot of what we do and the decisions we make and how we operate are influenced by the Ministry of Labor. So the partnership between the association and the Ministry of Labor is important. The Human Resources Professionals Association of Peel and Human Resources Professionals in general are, are vital partners to the Ministry of Labor because they are the champions in the workplace, the ambassadors that get to share the message about employment standards compliance, also around health and safety. The evening also provided an update on the implementation of Bill 168, which comes into effect on June 15th. It is a piece of legislation that will protect workers from violence and harassment in the workplace. It provides those protections for workers where if they feel that they are in imminent danger, that they can remove themselves from work, from work, they can refuse work and say, listen, this is too dangerous, this place. And on the employer, what we're asking of the employer is to do a risk assessment of their workplace. Well, I think uh, tonight's a good opportunity for dialogue, and I think uh, having the Minister of Labour here at an event here in Mississauga is important. Peter Von Seiko will be able to hear some of the issues and concerns that HR managers are being faced with. And there's quite a bit of legislation um, that is uh, happening all the time and uh, I'm sure it's a lot of work for HR managers to stay on top of and uh, I think uh, the Ministry of Labour is uh, you know, trying to make sure workplaces are safe and that's important. Um, but, uh, you know, dialogue is important between this association and the government and hopefully uh, the Minister is taking time to hear some of these concerns. The Ministry is also asking that employers have a policy and a program in place so that new employees are aware of any dangers that may exist around violence and harassment in the workplace. We also ask that employers have a policy and program in place so when a new employee comes on the staff, they are aware of any of the, uh, of the dangers that may exist around violence or harassment in that workplace. I say that because at times that violence or harassment may be coming from the outside. So we want to ensure that our employees are, are safe when they go to work. 
faces. Let's start from like a very Every week we bring you a great small business tip. This week our small business tip is from Heidi Brown of the Mississauga Business Enterprise Center on forming strategic alliances. Heidi? At our center we regularly meet people who've moved to Canada from another country and have chosen Mississauga as their new home. They're often seeking information on how to do business in Canada and to further support that Canada ranks number two in the world for the ease of starting a business. Today's business tip of the week is on how and where newcomers can access free information and resources to do business in Canada. Before you start doing business in Canada or any foreign country, we recommend that you get information, information and more information. As a first step, the government is your best resource for assessing free information on your business. Let's say, for example, you see an opportunity to import products from a foreign country. It's important to learn about the local market before you introduce it here in Canada. There is free information available from government websites on statistics and market research to help you learn about the local market. And some of these, this information is offered in a variety of languages. If you're looking for information on a particular industry, Canada has many industry associations, trade shows, publications and resources right in your own community by visiting the local library, board of trade, suppliers, and even local cultural organizations, it can prove to be a direct and effective way to learn about the industry. Next, you should consider the different permits and licenses needed and assess whether your business requires your education or experience to be recognized in Canada. Again, there are websites and local agencies that can assist you. So once you've researched the market, identified your permits and licenses, assessed your Canadian credentials, you may need to seek financing. Remember, if you're new to Canada, developing credit is important and plan to have some of your own funds set aside for your business venture. Thanks, Heidi. The In Business team searches every week for entrepreneurs who have a great story to tell. This week we found an entrepreneur who plays an international shell game from the comfort of his own home. Stay with us. We'll be back in 1 minute 30 seconds with Charles Rooker of Core Power. we find out how he got started right here on In Welcome back to In Business. Have you ever played a shell game? You need to watch very closely to know what the left hand and the right hand are doing. Our featured entrepreneur, Charles Rooker, is a tool and die maker and the founder of Core Powered. He is a classic entrepreneur. He identified a problem and fixed it. He joins us here in the studio to tell us how he got started. Charles, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Charles, Core Powered is the, is the third company that you, that you started. Yes. Take us back to the original one. What, did the, what was that company all about? The original company was Rooker Global Solutions. And I started that while I was working for another company. And the idea was to provide um, uh, expertise and ability to, to manufacturing companies, kind of like a consultant. And what I realized very quickly was in manufacturing, manufacturing companies don't want consultants. They want people that can supply them stuff. 
So I, I took a look at how I was going to uh, provide value for my customers and created a, a company supplying products using that model that I was planning on, on consulting with. And the second company was RH Collins. Was RH Collins. And and how did that develop, or how did that develop into the picture? We, we had a model in Rooker Global Solutions that was using um, the expertise of, of select companies, an exclusive group of companies, to to uh, deliver things faster at a lower cost and, and all that stuff. And what what we were doing in Rooker Global was it was it was really the model was hidden behind the product. And we decided to, to test it out in the marketplace. And we built RH Collets, which was a company that just had a single product line, fully using the model and letting people know how we were, how we were doing things and, and using that model. So at, off the top of the show, I said tongue in cheek, it was a shell game, which was probably the first model where you didn't yeah. really let everybody know what was going on. Exactly. But now, I, uh, through, uh, through RH Collets and through Core Powered, everybody knows everybody now. Right. And there's no concern that anybody's going to go direct and, and, uh, and cut you out of the picture? No, because the, 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 the companies that are involved in Core Powered, these are manufacturing guys. They like to build stuff. And the way they look at their products is their own product, and it's the best, and, and they just want to sell their product. But they've realized that the, their, to offer value in the marketplace, they've got to offer more than just a product. They've got to offer integrated solutions that will, that will require the expertise from other companies and they're happy to be part of this. And they, they know that, that they just want to focus on the work for their shop. So what you've been able to do is you've been able to source out these companies that have a core competency. You've been able to find the best of the best mm -hmm. in a particular area and move your product from company to company to get all of the pieces right. put together. That would seem like it should be more expensive. It would seem that way. But what we're doing is we're, we're, we're building our products with best practices. So think of a, a, a factory that might have one or two guys that are really good at things and they always get the work because they get the work done quicker. We've done that with companies. And so what, what added costs we have for shipping or logistics, they're far offset by the reduction in the actual cost to make something. Now you do have a story where you were actually, you were manufacturing a product and it went back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean and actually ended up being less lead time and less expensive. Right. How does that work? <laughs> Well, it all comes down to best practices. What we've, what we've done as part of the model in Rooker Global was to make sure that each one of the members knew that they were only going to work on the part that they were the best at. So what we're able to do is, is, is dissect the component that's being made and break it down into the, the, the stages of manufacturing and make sure that stage fits the organization that has the best ability to produce it. Manufacturing has been taking a hard hit in Canada. What's your opinion of the future of manufacturing in Canada? In Canada, it's, it's going to be a long, tough run. I think uh, Canadian manufacturing is never going to recover f to what it was um, um, pre two, three years ago. Uh, the, the Canadian dollar doesn't help. Uh, th there's, there's just not a large focus on manufacturing in Canada. In Ontario, there is, but in Canada as a whole, as, as long as we've got a lot of good stuff in the ground that's worth a lot of money, mm -hmm. that's really going to take precedent. Now, years ago, you, know, you started off as a tool and die maker. What gave you the idea that you wanted to uh, be, become an entrepreneur and be your own boss? <laughs> Restlessness. <laughs> <laughs> Big fish in a little pond. <laughs> a, a lot of things. Over the years, I, I um, uh, actually have a funny, uh, um, an odd story. When I was in my early 30s, I told somebody, or my late 20s, I told somebody, by the time I'm in my mid-40s or late 40s, I want to be telling companies or helping companies how to do things. And that's about when I started my business. And that, and that was it? You just decided one day that you were going to do that? Well, now, how did the, when you started your company, though, did you just switch on, switch off, or were you working at it part-time for a while? No, I, I just started my own, I started, I was working for a company that was giving me a paycheck, mm -hmm. and, then, and then I decided I was going to start my business, and I left that company. So it was all or nothing. Um, how did your wife feel about this? Well, she had a full-time job. It was great. Oh, so <laughs> she was paying so the bills. So, <laughs> so it worked out okay. Worked out very well. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so t has it been an easy uh, ride all the way through? Have you had some struggles along the way? Absolutely not an easy ride. Uh, you know, starting out my business, I thought I knew a lot of things about business. And I'm sorry, we've got to take a quick break. We'll be back with Charles Rooker of Core Power right after the break.
Welcome back to In Business. We're in the studio with Charles Rooker of Core Powered, finding out how he got started. So we, before we went to the break, we were talking about how an easy uh, run it has been for you since you started all these companies. Uh, what are some of the tough things that you've been through? Knowing how to run a business. Um, you know, there's, there's the part of making the product and interacting with the customers, but then there's all the pieces of running a business and how to, how to manage overhead, uh, all the accounting things like profit margins and, and that, and, and, I, and I wasn't trained in any of that. So uh, we had good products, we, had, we got good customers, but we had to learn how to actually run a business. So what's the, what's the secret behind the way that you run your business? Because you, you run a, a virtual operation, but mm -hmm. you've really got a lot of things going on that you need to you need to be in touch with and uh, and in control of. Now the customers are coming to you, but you could be looking after you know, four or five different operations when it comes to a particular product. Right. We 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 take the the practice that we use with our customer or our products, and we bring that right in house. So we're looking for people that we can identify their unique ability. So we we have two two people on staff, and they have, they, they their their unique ability is the jobs that they're doing. So they're able to do a, a lot of things extremely well because we focus on making sure that they're just doing the jobs that, that they love to do. Mm -hmm. Is there uh, anything that you would do differently? You know, looking back over the years, anything that you would do differently? Oh yeah, I don't think we have that much time. <laughs> you know, well, know, we got a couple minutes. <laughs> knowing what I know now, I, th I think I could have produced these results uh, probably two or three years sooner. Uh, I know that in, in the development of the process, I missed some, some global curves. Like India was a, was a low cost, very attractive uh, company to look at for buying and selling to. And in, it, like within the last two years, it, that's all changed. So I missed the boat there. It would have been nicer to be uh, a little bit more mature coming into this last recession. We would have been able to take even greater advantage of the recession. So, so timing. Everything just took a lot longer than, than I thought it was going to take. And we've had a lot of we had a lot of discussion about uh, about going global and and doing business in uh, in China and, and yeah. India. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is that a good spot for Canadian manufacturers to try and go to? I think it is. I th I think it's I think it's where the money is going to be made. But it, but it has to be created in a way where there's a real partnership and a relationship created. The, I don't know as much about the Chinese market as the Indian market, but it's all about relationship. And the product and what you would sell in India is worth a fraction of what it is in North America. So you're not going to get rich by making product and selling in India. What you will do is you'll be able to discover market niches that Canadian manufacturing will be able to sell into out of the relationship. In other words, creating a relationship in India creates the context for doing business over in India, mm -hmm. and then the content has a place to land. You were mentioning that uh, there is a certain pecking order that you need to go through in order to <laughs> yeah. break into that Indian market. Uh, through all of the, uh, the, the businesses that you've been through, and you've had a couple of uh, rough rides, did you ever think about giving up? Uh, in the beginning, I did. When there wasn't as much at stake and, and I wasn't as seasoned, I'd say for the first year, year and a half, after that, no, I, we, I, I started uh, taking a look at what my future needed to be, 10 years out, 20 years out, and I, and I, and I painted a future that I just wanted to have. Mm -hmm. And this, the, this is a logical piece that fits into making that future a reality. So it motivates me to keep slugging through whatever's here, because I know this is just now, it's not forever. So what's the, what's the th what goes through your head that keeps you going? Well, a 52-foot catamaran in the Caribbean and living <laughs> on it for half a year. <laughs> and, 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 and you're achieving part of that goal now. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we, we've designed the whole business to fulfill on future dreams. And that includes every, everybody that's involved in the business. Um, uh, part of that is we're doing a retreat this year, to, uh, a, a, a business planning uh, for a future retreat. That's in Barbados. You know, that's where we want to be for part of our life. And you're taking all of your partners uh, on this retreat to talk about the business. Not this year. Oh, not this year. That's Some of them. the future? Some of them. This mm -hmm. In future years, yeah. And, and one of those partners that's going with you, I imagine, is your lovely bride? Of course. <laughs> um, and, and one of our staff that's going, uh -huh. is going. And uh, it's our way of um, rewarding uh, people as well. You know, they work hard for the business and they see us celebrating in the, 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 the benefit of it. They need to be part of that. Well, that's a nice business model to be able to build where you can uh, operate your business for six months completely remotely. And certainly that's the great model that you built. We've got about um, just under a minute to go. What advice do you have for the entrepreneurs that are watching the show? Pick a market and don't deviate. Just stay with it. it, 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 it nothing is static. It, it keeps moving and you need to keep moving with it. Uh, you have a couple of children. Anybody coming into the business? 
I don't know. Uh, I don't know. They're, they're, Would you want them in the business? Uh, I'd love it. Uh, my, my advice to them is to go out and get a job and make it on their own and come into the business with something to offer. Absolutely. That's a great piece of advice. DNA doesn't give them entitlement to the business. They've yeah, got to exactly. be bringing something in. That's great. Thanks to my guest, Charles Rooker, for being with us. Up next, Michael Rosenberg reviews the book, The Living Company. We'll be back right after a word, few words from our sponsors. Welcome back to In Business. I'm your host, David Wojcik. The only competitive advantage for any organization is to think faster than their competitors. Faster, better, smarter are the new keywords for business. On our upcoming book review, we look at a man who coined that phrase and wrote one of the best business books that no one has ever heard of. The Living Company, Habits for Survival in a Turbulent Business Environment by Ari DeJuice looks at the common strategies that companies use to weather bad times. Michael Rosenberg filed this review of The Living Company. The Living Company by Ari Degu. I have to tell you, I love this book. Yeah, I know that Harvard published it, but it's still a good book anyway. In The Living Company, Degu, a former senior executive of Shell turned business professor at Harvard, looks at how organizations are able to adapt and grow in the long term. The story behind The Living Company is interesting. As a senior executive in charge of strategy at Shell in the mid-80s, the company has experienced a significant downturn. Degu is told by the CEO to find companies that are at least as old as Shell and as large and find out what they have and how they've been able to get through difficult times. Degu starts by picking up the Fortune 500 from 1985 and compares it to 1971. What he finds amazes him. Within a 13-year period, over one-third of the companies listed are gone. Companies in the 1971 top 50 included companies such as American Can, Rapid American, and Sealed Air. These were billion dollar companies gone from the face of the earth in less than 14 years. In looking at his assignment, Degu was only able to identify 36 companies in the world that met the CEO's standards. Degu then looked at the differences between those companies and the ones that failed. Although he is the first to admit that his findings are not quote unquote scientifically proven or even quote unquote up to stringent academic standards, his conclusions are nonetheless quite fascinating. Here are the four components of what he believes is the difference between those companies that survive and those that do not. They are one, sensitivity to the environment. In this case, he's not talking about green technologies. The environment here is the cultural, generational and technological environment of the time and place that the company is located. Sensitivity to the environment, in Degu's words, represent a company's ability to learn and adapt. Two, cohesion and identity are aspects of a company's innate ability to build a community and brand for itself, both internal and externally. Three, tolerance and decentralization is the company's ability to build constructive relationships with other entities, both within and outside itself, as well as its awareness of ecology. And finally, four, conservative financing. 
As any business owner knows, your ability to govern your own finances, growth, and evolution effectively can be the major difference between success and failure. Degu recognizes that each organization is unique and also looks at both those who fail and those who succeed to garner insight. The Living Company by Ari Degus is, in my opinion, one of the best business books ever written. Thanks, Michael. Who said there is no such thing as a free lunch? The practice started back in the 1800s when saloons would feed you as long as you continued to drink. The free lunch continues today, and Neville Pockroy tells us why it should be part of your marketing strategy. Neville? Do you feel all alone in trying to sell in your business? Many people with small businesses suffer from the same frustration, and this often leads to two outcomes. First, they hire people to sell, or they push themselves even harder to take on more responsibility. Well, there is another option. Have you thought about developing a referral program that you can introduce to a wide range of people with the goal of them introducing prospects to you in return for a referral fee? While this is not the same as commission selling, it is a useful tool for enlarging your informal sales force and having many people earn some easy money for just doing the introductions. Be careful, however, with the details of the referral program. The referral may not in itself be sufficient for you to make a payout. More likely, a sale from that referral is more likely a condition. However, each business is different, and each business owner will need to define the value of each and every referral. All of this is up to you to define. Make sure it's a win-win for you and the referral. There are many business events happening in Peel Region. Here's Gary Collins and Sheldon Liba to tell us about a few taking place in Brampton and Mississauga. The Brampton Board of Trade hosts monthly after-business networking sessions. These, uh, these events are free to our members. It's an opportunity for members to uh, mix and mingle. And uh, our upcoming uh, events are taking place on May 27th. We'll be at Source Office Furnishings which is located at the corner of Steeles and Rutherford Road. This event will run from 5 to 7 p.m. And this is actually the grand opening of uh, this new furniture store located in Brampton. So I would encourage members to come out and enjoy a, a free networking opportunity. Our after business in June will take place at Aria Bistro, located at 485 Main Street North in Brampton. This is the former location of the Sanos. They've changed the name, but it's still under the same ownership of Alberto and Lisa. Uh, this uh, networking event, as I mentioned, will take place on June 22nd from 4.30 till 6.30. And I would encourage uh, members or potential members to come out 
and uh, learn more about the Brampton Board of Trade and it's a good opportunity to uh, network with our fellow members. So uh, keep those two dates in mind. May 27th and June 22nd we will be hosting our after business events. The Mississauga Board of Trade is pleased to host its ever popular Good Morning Mississauga business networking event on the second Wednesday of each month from 7.30 to 9.30 a.m. Over the past year, we have attracted record attendance at this event, with up to 150 attending each month, providing a great opportunity to connect with business and business people in the city as potential clients, suppliers, partners, and referral contacts, all at one time in one location. On Wednesday, June 9th, Good Morning Mississauga will be held at Palladium, 99 Rathburn Road West. Be sure to come armed with lots of business cards to exchange, have a nice hot breakfast, and network with many wonderful like-minded business people. MBOT members are provided the opportunity to reserve a two-minute speaking spot to introduce themselves and their business and can bring flyers and company information to the event for display. If you want to get connected and to build your business in Mississauga, then come join us at Good Morning Mississauga. For more information, visit the Mississauga Board Trade website at www.mbot.com. The telecom industry can make you or break you. They have been the darlings and the duds. What makes the great ones great and why do they fall from grace? In the studio today, we have two experts on the subject. Rod McQueen has been one of Canada's most important business journalists. He has written books about the fall of Confederation life, the Eatons and Manulife. His most recent book is Blackberry, the inside story of research in motion where he had unprecedented access to RIM founders Jim Balsilli and Mike Lazaridis. Also with us is Lauren Surtees, Canada's number one telecom analyst. There is no one who knows more about telecom than Lawrence. He has uh, offered a sector advice for more than 28 years and is the global authority on Nortel Networks. He joined IDC Canada in September 2000, where he manages the firm's research into wireline, the wireless, and the internet sectors. Lawrence also spent 17 years as a reporter at the Globe and Mail. Rod, Lawrence, welcome to the show. Thank you, Thank you David. So let's talk about those. Uh, we've, talk, we, we've, we've got the rising stars, but let's talk about those falling stars. And of course, the big one that comes to mind is Nortel. What happened to Nortel? Well, geez, David, <laughs> it's more like an explosion of a galaxy, a supernova. Um, I guess what happened was, you know, like a lot of high-tech companies in its field in the telecom equipment space, uh, got hammered by the dot-com bust that started to happen in 2000, became, you know, wildly apparent in late winter of 2001. But then as it slowly, agonizingly became apparent, Nortel was falling victim, continued victim, uh, it was almost like Monty Python, you know, take my other leg, just a flesh wound. <laughs> okay, now my other arm. And, uh, you know, what happened was 
there was the parallel underlying story that became, you know, it took a while to become apparent of accounting misstatements, irregularities, um, you know, I hate to use the F word, fraud, because um, I'm not a criminal lawyer, although there's been grand jury and ongoing investigations in mm -hmm. Dallas, Texas, and the RCMP and whatnot. Um, so basically, you know, so things stabilized after the dot-com bust. This business still remains important. They're, you know, like RIM, but Nortel was one of those vast global arms merchants of high tech that everybody's still going to need the stuff. Mm. But unlike the other competitors, um, the street and even some customers couldn't get renewed confidence because of like three, three and a half years of restatements mm -hmm. and then a pre, you know, a successive leadership uh, getting charged with fraud. Um, so in a, in a short answer, uh, hubris, greed, um, and you know, the vicissitude of market cycles, boom, bust, echo. Mm -hmm. um, in their case, it was boom, bust, fraud. I think we've got a bigger problem than just Nortel's collapse in this country. 143 years since Confederation, you can count on one hand the number of Canadian-based firms in the manufacturing business who had any kind of global presence. Mm -hmm. You had Massey Ferguson in the 19th century. Gone. You had Busted soul. <laughs> gone, long gone. gone. <laughs> Bad of shoes, strong for a while, but mm -hmm. gone. Avril, Bum, Avril, Avril, Avril. Well, they never, they never really got off the ground. I'm talking about companies that had a position and then lost it. Mm -hmm. Bombardier still does. Mm -hmm. Magnus Auto Parts, obviously. Nortel has, has just been mentioned. Five companies, 143 years. But why? And now, What's the difference? Well, I think one of the issues is that we we don't count on our real natural resources, which, which is one of the, the great things about research in motion. Mike Lazaridis and Jim Balsley don't see natural resources as oil and gas or uranium or whatever it might be. They see it as people, and they are the, the I, major I the global that manufacturing that firm. So, in did, the, so did Sorry, I just wanted yeah. to finish up yeah. one sentence here, Lawrence. Uh, they wanted to see, they see it as a 21st century answer. And I think it's a great story, and we need yeah. more of them. So their natural resource is not something that's depletable. Their natural resource is really something that's renewable. No, that's right. When yeah. they first started to erect buildings, when they got large enough, mm -hmm. uh, Mike Lazaridis didn't have enough money to put a, a sign on all sides of the, of the first two buildings <laughs> he put up. So he said, put it on the back. I want it to face the University of Waterloo campus because of course they're based in Waterloo, <laughs> so that the students know where we are. Right. And they can come and work here when they're graduates. Rod race is the great issue of the history, but I think there's something beyond people. The, the Nortel and all these other, Massey saw the resources people, mm -hmm. but what is it about Canada that we can't continue to keep these companies here or succeed? So the question begs with Nortel recently, why was the strategy pursued? by the last leadership that every part would be broken up and sold and nothing kept. When you know, one of the buyers of the core engine of their technology is Siena, is, is you know, committed to keeping the optical labs in Ottawa and the 2400 researchers in Ottawa, Montreal. Why couldn't Nortel? You know, and I don't know the answer to that. There's another company in history, a great Canadian high tech company that was a world leader that went up for sale and not one bid came from Canadians, whether they were private venture, public markets, or, or but competitors. But the fact of the matter Lomotics. is in Canada though, Lawrence, it's very, but, it's a lot tougher to raise that but, kind but, of capital but, but, but no, in Canada I don't, I don't than it is in the United no, States. No, I think that's a non sequitur because if that was truly the case, how would these companies even get going? There's something more fundamental and flawed in Canadian capitalism for 150 years of corporate history, even we forget about Molson's too, um, so or the Hudson's Bay. So we're going to take a short break here. We're going to come back and, and chat about them. it. But what I'd like to find out after the break is, so what's different about RIM? Because they're so strong, they're the darling of the industry. Everybody wants them. What's different about them? We'll have more with Lauren Surtees and Rod McQueen right after the break.
Welcome back to In Business. In the studio, we have Lauren Surtees and Rod McQueen, and we are discussing Canada's technology rising stars. So let's talk about RIM. We've talked about Nortel and, and gee was what happened to them. What, RIM is the darling on the hardware side, and as we talked off break, in their niche market. They don't really venture off of that. So why? what makes them different? What? Why are they like that? Is, is that their corporate culture? Uh, is it because they uh, um, they just don't know any better or are they smarter than everybody else? Nothing like doing one thing well and beating everybody else at that That's game. Right. I spent four years working on this book. It, it seemed like a long time when I was doing it. The, uh, the last uh, interview I had with Mike Lazaridis, I had six of them all together. He said, aren't you glad it's taken so long to get this book done? And I thought, how does this work? <laughs> and he said, when we first uh, started to meet, uh, BlackBerry was just a niche product. And he said, now we're the market leader in the U.S. They've got 43% of the uh, smartphone business in North America, and Apple is uh, about half that, and everybody else is back in the distance. Palm and Motorola and right. all these big names that uh, were big companies when Research in Motion was just 100 employees yes. in 1997. And now they're over 13,000, two-thirds of them in Waterloo. So they've focused on the product. They haven't just stayed in, the, in business, both large and small. They also have consumer versions now. They are, it's very safe. Everything is encrypted. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody can uh, you know, listen in on what your, what your email is. And uh, the world's heading in that direction. Of course, if there's any danger to it, it's that when BlackBerry servers go down, <laughs> the world grinds to a halt. I mean, we saw that through uh, some world. of the elections. That's right. um, anybody that you can think of that can rival uh, RIM well, in the, that space, Lawrence? That's my, yeah, the, 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 the risk or the fear that, that the RIM leadership has to have and are obviously dealing with is they can't be just a one-trick pony or have that pony only in one market segment. But gee, it's it's fine. It's but fine. it's been doing so well. It's fine when you've got solely the leadership in it. But what's happened in the last few years is the apples with its new products are, have opened up the consumer space. And so the complementary challenge, RIM has to try to do something in the consumer market if the apples are going to move up into the business well, world, which like, is a very you real You make it sound fear. like they're not succeeding. BlackBerry yeah. is now available through 500, more than 500 carriers in 170 countries around the world. 40% of all their new sales, all their new subscribers every month are consumers. They're soccer moms, they're students. They're not, yep. mm -hmm. they're not businesses. They're coming out with new models all the time. They're but not going to do what Apple has done and have, a, have something to download you know, music and something to right. look at movies. Mike Lazaridis' view of where BlackBerry is going, that in five years, BlackBerry will replace the laptop. But he's not going to bring out a laptop mm -hmm. in a while. So if it's a one-trick pony, as, uh, <laughs> as Churchill <laughs> might say, some trick, some pony. <laughs> well, I was going to say, is there, a da is there a downside to it? Is there a danger to it? I mean, when we, we talked about the IBM downfall, and that wasn't because they were a one-trick one pony. It was because of the mentality of the uh, of the management. They didn't change. Fast they didn't change enough. fast well, there's enough. Always, there's so always a danger. Is there a danger I, there? Well, at of course, rim. there's always a danger that you're not keeping but up. But so far, so good. It's a very interesting relationship the two men have, uh, Mike Lazaridis and Jim Balsley. They're both chief executive officers, which is very unusual. Very unusual. Seventeen years For they've so had that too. relationship. That's right. I don't know of another company in the world that does it that way. They don't look over each other's shoulders. They, you know, Mike's got the engineering and. The research and development. Jim's got the business and finance side. He said, "I raise the money, and, and Mike spends it, and <laughs> it works." Fifty-fifty relationship. And the <laughs> the uh, organization is a very open uh, place. Everybody's got Blackberries, obviously, so communications is good. There are no hierarchical sort of layers. Every year they bring in a thousand students from ten different universities in the U.S. and Canada for work terms. So they've got all these new ideas bubbling up from within. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be a problem at some point in the future? Who knows? I'm not unable to predict <laughs> that. You, or you didn't I'm, leave the but, crystal ball. But, so but to date, they've done very well. You can't argue with the success yeah, they've had. So, Lawrence, what, what, can, what can other 
telecoms or what can other technology companies learn from, from what BlackBerry's done or what Rim has done? Or, or from Nortel? Or, or from Nortel. What, what are the lessons that they should be learning? I mean, a number of them. Rod hit on a couple good ones. One, the management, the, the bilateral relationship between you know, the founder, the technological brains who recognized that one of the downfalls of many small high-tech companies is when they go to the next stage, they lack the depth uh, of managing and running a large firm, much less a technologically complex and multinational one. So that that's the that's, roots that's of, the, of, of their relationship. I can find two other examples in Mitel in its early days between oh, yeah. Um, you know, Mike and Terry, Mike Copeland and, and Terry Matthews, who were the co-founders and had complementary skill sets and strengths, um, but then moved on. They didn't stay together for 17 mm -hmm. years. They then founded other things, and now Terry, Sir the Terry biggest, is back at my The time. biggest mistake then, any entrepreneur makes is thinking he or she can do it all and doesn't hire exactly. people who can do a job, and, and then if they do hire the right person, spend all their time trying to second guess this uh, individual that they've, that they've just hired. So we got to go for the another other quick lesson. break here when we come oh. back, but I'd like to talk about, we've got these big ones like founders, like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, the founders of those big companies that they let the professionals take over. We'll have more with Lauren Surtees and Rod McQueen. We'll be back right after the break. Welcome back to In Business. In the studio, we have Lauren Surtees and Rod McQueen, and we are discussing Canada's rising stars in technology. So we've, we've it's, I mean, of course, BlackBerry and, and all the other uh, technology companies are fascinating. Uh, we were talking about those, the, the founders of the company, the Bill Gates, the Steve Jobs, the Lazaritis, the Ball Sillies of the world. They've got these massive companies. Now, have they all been smart enough to do what all the business uh, uh, consultants and coaches will tell you? Find great people to do what they do best and leave them alone and your company will grow. Have they been able to do that at RIM? Well, they certainly have uh, to date. Uh, when the company was still small and growing, Mike Lazaridis and Jim Balsley would hire everybody directly. And when, when the company mm -hmm. finally sort of edged close to 1,000 employees, they finally gave up and said, mm -hmm. we can't do this anymore, but they'd hired enough people of the sort that they wanted at Research in Motion that they really established what the culture was going to be like, and so they're able to replicate that as, uh, as the company grew. Between 97 and 2000, they really put all the senior executives into place, and there hasn't been a change since then. Hmm. They really knew the right people, they put them in place, and have been able to grow appropriately with, uh, with that kind of crew on hand. And what about the ones that can't do it? Different advice? companies, different times, right? Yeah. So Nortel's an interesting case study in that the complexity of what it developed and sold was broader. Um, there were two periods 
and arguably the golden age when Bob Scrivener, uh, who was the president of Bell, made the decision technology, not only what the technology was, and in hindsight, brilliant time and moment in, in, in human history, uh, and said they were going to go it alone. They were going to get away from AT&T, bet on the technologies, brought in the people, and then also recognized his limitations as a business leader. He quit as the president of Bell and said, I want to be the president of this and help set up the labs and the technology. And so at that moment there was, and then passed him to Walter Light as the company then went the next level to go global, was blessed with an engineer who knew the technology, who also knew people, Walter Light. Um, who was the greatest CEO at Nortel? Um, I would have to say it's a race between those two. Mm -hmm. um, Bob Scrivener, in, at, in terms of being the visionary, the architect, a non-technical guy who bet the farm and who understood what the technology could do as maybe the customer. Um, and in hindsight, just did so many ballsy things that you know, I explored back in the book in the early 90s. And he had never sought media attention mm -hmm. uh, in his day. And, and uh, there's just extraordinary stories. So now, even, we're going, now we're going back to the good to, so good to great scenario where it's yeah. not the most flamboyant so leaders that are the great leaders, it's the ones that well, I, think the, the I think the other thing that's at work here now, particularly with research in motion, that they've got to the size they now are, mm -hmm. people are beginning to leave the company and start up their own uh, do, companies. Do they support that kind of stuff? Well, I guess they would rather have good people stay, but they also know <laughs> Mike's an entrepreneur. <laughs> he, uh, he understands people who want to do startups. And I think what we're beginning to see now, we've uh, and certainly Nortel was part of what used to be called Silicon Valley North in Ottawa, which is now much smaller than it was. But I think what we're going to see over the next 50 years in Waterloo is what's happened in Southern California yeah. with yeah. Stanford. You know, yeah. night, we've got a few years to make up yet. I mean, Hewlett Packard got launched in the 1930s. But I think what we're going to see there is a, is a whole host of companies that will draw on. I mean, we're paying all this money to send our, our young people to school to graduate, right? Yes. I mean, uh, tax dollars are supporting university education. Why don't we keep these young people in Canada growing with companies and, uh, and, and rather Waterloo, than heading off to Microsoft? The Waterloo area is doing a fantastic job at promoting themselves it's as the technology capital of Canada. It's They're the next Ottawa, Canada, and, and Nortel, arguably, like Yeah, whatever happened Lazaridis. to Canada, that was supposed to be the... No, it's still there, Silicon and there's still... Yeah. Mytel's <laughs> still there, <laughs> and... But, what, and, and, and <laughs> but what's important is Northern had, like Lazaridis, recognized that not one company can do it all in, in even its own field in high tech. And so guys would leave Nortel, for example, in the labs with more expertise, build a company that would become a supplier or spawn you know, some next generation subcomponents that the next life, we don't know in five years what the Blackberry will look like in five yeah. years. It's going to be different. Maybe it's going to be, be chip in our arm. new and improved. Who's the, uh, in your opinion right now, but who's the greatest CEO leading a technology company in Canada? Well, I would say Lazaridis. Well, Barron's has just put him on their top 30 CEOs. So you both say the, Lazaridis. And it isn't just the yeah. spin-offs. He's, he's throwing, you know, what, $300 million of his own investment and money oh, no, to create the Pointer well, Institute between, between of, of quantum physics in yeah, Waterloo. Well, well, the perimeter. Yeah, the, perimeter. Uh, both he and, uh, and Jim Balsillia, they're this mid-career philanthropy is quite remarkable. They have they've put $400 million into the community in uh, Waterloo. Governments and other donors have added it. So there's $700 million at work now in the yeah. Perimeter Institute. Uh, the Center for International Governance, Innovation, the schools, it's a huge and change in a well, place of 100,000 people. And we've got about a minute to go. So Pointers a like bet to, on a new science. I'd like to, I'd like to just talk, what's the future for Canada's technology? Um, in, I think as long, 20 seconds. as long as there's people like Lazaridis who are here investing in it and investing in what's on the horizon with an understanding mm -hmm. um, that these are long-term bets, I think the future. I think, I think the here. future looks good. I think, and if we had ten companies like Rim, imagine how we'd feel. We'd feel as prideful every day as we did when 
They beat the U.S. Or in hockey at one, the Olympics. One like Norto Absolutely. before it became a victim of hubris and hype. And I'm that, sorry we got to go. We're out of time. A special thanks to my panel guests, Rob McQueen and Lawrence Assertis. If you have a question for us at In Business or idea for the show, go to our website, www.rogerstv.com. We'll get back to tell you about next week's show. Next week, we bring you coverage of the Brampton Business Awards. Another great business tip from Cassandra Backerdax of the Brampton Business Enterprise Center. Our featured entrepreneur works in a haze. We have another classic business book under a review. Neville Pockery is on hand with more marketing advice. And our panel discusses going green. Thanks for watching and have a successful week in your business.